Good morning, my name is Mike Klein. Thank you for being here and listening to my story. Uh, I'll begin by uh, saying that if you have any questions, you can ask them uh, during my presentation if you want to. Thank you. Uh, I had a great and have a great interest in aviation and have all my life. I built all kinds of uh, model airplanes back in the 40s uh, and ended uh, building gasoline-powered airplanes. And when I was 16, a friend of mine who also built airplanes, my parents took us to a small abandoned airport outside of Los Angeles. Uh, there was a contest and we were busy uh, flying our uh, gasoline uh, airplanes and uh, I was preparing for another flight and I happened to look at the grandstand and my dad was waving at me to co come to him. So I asked my friend to shut the engine off on my uh, model airplane and ran over there and he, I said, what's the matter? Because we were ignoring the announcements on, at the grandstand. Uh, my dad says the uh, Pearl Harbor has just been bombed by the Japanese and we have to go home right now. So I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was at 16 years old. So you know how he did in history. <laughs> uh, we packed up and went home and uh, naturally the war came very, very uh, quick. and. Uh, I was 17, I asked my parents' permission to enlist in the Air Force. They uh, thought about it for a while and then they, they okayed it. So uh, I graduated uh, high school. We were uh, sworn in on the um, major uh, <laughs> movie theater in downtown Los Angeles by some Air Force officers and very close uh, to uh, the end of 1943 uh, with a telegram to report to uh, basic training. And I, I, was, I don't know if I mentioned it, I was brought up and we were born and raised in Los Angeles. We were sent here to Buckley Field to take my basic training for six weeks and uh, we didn't like uh, most of us got KP. We didn't like the first sergeant there. He was pretty tough on us. From there, we were sent to uh, Kingman, Arizona for gunnery training, where we learned how to blindfold, detail strip a 50 caliber machine gun and put it back together blindfolded. We said we can never do it. You should have heard all the guys moaning, we'll never do it, but we did it. That was six weeks long. At the end, <coughs> there was a, uh, a meeting with officers to congratulate us on the graduation and said there was about 100 of us, mostly young guys like me, 18, 19 years old. I have good news and bad news. The good news is that you can become a gunnery uh, person or a ground, part of the ground crew <coughs> the bad news is we have enough pilots, co-pilots, bombardiers, and navigators. I wanted to fly. I wanted to be a pilot, but I was going to fly at any, for any reason and any way I could and help defend the United States in the war against our enemies. 18 year, years old, you're really gung-ho. And uh, we then went to Rapid City, South Dakota to take crew training where we met, met the officers and the other gunners for six weeks, which was a lot, very exciting uh, and new to us and did all kinds of different things in V-17 bombers. One where the pilots would sort of fool around with us when the end of the gunnery training, they would these young second lieutenants would pretend the B-17s were like fighters and all of the gunners had gathered in the waist of this B-17 and were plastered up against the side of the airplane. You know, they were, they just 
trying to be funny, and uh, I'll never forget that. At the end of this training, we uh, went as uh, crew uh, members to Omaha, Nebraska, where there was some three, four hundred brand new B-17s parked there, which we, uh, where each crew was given a bomber and all, all the uh, information on how to fly to England. Well, we went uh, from Omaha to Bangor, Maine, and from there to Iceland, where we stayed overnight. <laughs> and um, the USO had a, uh, a program for us. Marlena Dietrich was there as a singer, and she, I remember what a beautiful voice she has. And of course, she was a very beautiful lady, so all the young guys were, you know, <laughs> applauding and all that stuff. And from there, we flew to southern England, where we left the bombers to be um, camouflaged and make uh, improvements or, and changes in the bombers. We were put on a train, and uh, my crew and several others uh, went by train <coughs> to a small town about 90 miles north of uh, London, uh, directly between Norwich and Ipswich to a small town called Dis, D-I-S-S, -S, and the name of the air, air base was Horum, H-O-R-U-M, and um, there we uh, were billeted and uh, got all our equipment, different things, and uh, I think that you know a lot of my beginnings, and then from now I think we can start talking uh, about uh, the core of my my story. <coughs> That's our shoulder insignia, 8th Air Force. I belong to the 95th Bomb Group. That's our insignia. And my squadron was the 334th Bombardment Squadron, made up of 18 airplanes, 18 B-17s. And we flew in the B-17H, which was a modernized B-17 and had the new chin turn installed where it was run electronically by the bombardier or the navigator and was very effective until the Luftwaffe found out that we could knock them down and they sort of varied their frontal attacks because that chin turn, twin 50s, was very deadly. There were other improvements. Um, we trained in the United States, all the, all the uh, 50 caliber machine guns had iron sights. It was a ring and, and a post, but when we le left the B-17 bombers at this huge base in southern England, um, the waist gunners, the tail gunner, and uh, let's see, was the radio? radio guy, I'm not sure. We received electronic sights, which automatically, there were two electronic um, vertical orange, and they called them reticles, and when we lined them up, we knew we had the enemy in that sight. It was a big improvement. All, everything we learned in gunnery school, which was all handheld and had the iron sights, uh, was a lot different but we felt a lot more secure with these and, and actually the downing rate did raise somewhat. We, these guys came in pretty fast. It was kind of hard to hit them. Okay. This is a brief when World War II began. Our involvement after the bombing of Pearl Hammer, Har um, Harbor, when the European War ended and the Asian War ended. Just a little information about me. How old were you in that picture, Mike? Uh, I was 18 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had a lot of hair then, as you know. Well, it, it looks like that, but it's, it's thin. 
Uh, no, I. Uh, my, my hair. That was my hair. Yes. When an engagement happened, when the enemy came in, how long did the engagement last? If you had, uh, if you had 20 seconds, you were lucky. Maybe most of the time was less because. Uh, most of the, our attacks that I can remember, it was Messerschmitt 409, they had a top speed of about 400 and 435 or 440 miles an hour top speed. And uh, they had all kinds of tricks. They, uh, they came in on the pursuit curve. They came in from below. The belly gunner would try to shoot them, the waist gunners. and. Uh, the, even the radio man had 150 caliber. If anything he could see, he would shoot at. And of course, up front, if we were going to a target, the bombardier hadn't, hadn't started to make his adjustments on the northern bomb side that he could fire that chin turn. The navigator had two handheld guns, one of uh, 50 calibers on either side. Um, his, that 20 seconds was a, was a gift because uh, most of the time the, everybody in the whole group was very cognizant of the attack. So if one, if one gunner or one somebody sighted fighters, then we were all on the alert. And if they started to make their attacks, we were, we, we were given a lot of information. But the amount of time was uh, next to nothing. A couple of seconds, five seconds. At, at the, yes, that's average. And you just uh, lined them up and, and let them have it. And if you were lucky, you could hit them. But, uh, I, never, I never shot down a, uh, a fighter in, a, in tail position. They stayed away from the tail. Uh, you know, the old-fashioned attack from behind the pursuit curve the tail gunner and the engineer on top with the top turret was very effective. So they had other, you know, they, sta they knew that uh, they that were very accurate. The top turret was a electronically controlled turret and uh, my two guns were handheld. But I didn't have too big, you know, a radius or, you know, I couldn't do this or like that. It was just limited. Uh, well, here's some pictures. Yeah, there's some sure. better pictures okay. about this. Okay, all right. Maybe we can speak to about that. Here's, here's the uh, B-17, uh, like we ferried over from Omaha, was uncamouflaged, un had the new chin turn on it. And uh, uh, we, when we left Iceland, was all the way over ocean to southern England. Everybody made it. All brand new airplanes. They're really slick, and uh, it was a good feeling to be in a brand new airplane like that. You know, like a new car, sort of. I mean, that's not a good description, but if you had a good piece of equipment, you had a. It just was a good feeling. Okay. Well, this good-looking fellow in the corner with all the hair—that's me. <laughs> Guy next to me—that's Tony. He was a waist gunner. That's uh, Stan. That he was another waist gunner. Uh, Bill Lewis. That was the radio man. Uh, Tony was a uh, belly gunner, which I didn't like. I didn't want to be in. I trained in it, but I wanted. Uh, it was a very dangerous position to be in. The uh, the belly gunner. Because when you went into it, you were locked in. You could not get out of it. And when you uh, started to get into enemy territory, the uh, waste gunners would uh, electronically, uh, the guns when you were flying were always uh, horizontal. When you went to get in it, they would, uh, on this uh, control, they'd put the gun straight down and this huge ball would rotate it and they'd unlock the door and you would step into it and actually your knees were almost up you were like in a a fetal position you know what i'm say saying your back was sort of curved and your knees were here and your your controls 
you and you were looking through your feet. There was a round plexiglass window, and the two guns were there, and you could rotate it horizontally and uh, go up and down. You couldn't go up. It was level with the bottom of the aircraft. Once you were locked in, if that plane was hit and in, in started to go down or had serious damage and the electronics were gone, there was a crank which took a lot of time to go this and many uh, ball turn gunners went down with the airplane because the two waist gunners couldn't get out unless they jumped right away. So it didn't happen too often, but the belly gunner uh, lost his life because they could not rotate that turn electronically and have them open that door and have them step out. It's really sad, which is one of the reasons I was glad I got the tail position. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean to laugh, but it, it's from a uh, uh, terrible feeling that I say that. Mike, yes. Were the guns set up so that you could shoot your own plane? Yes. So yeah. Well, uh, well, I, I hit his own wing. Correct. No, they were below the turns of the four propellers, and the uh, no other gun could hit the airplane except the engineer who wrote, uh, operated that top turn. Because if he went back and was tracking and the vertical stabilizers there, none was ever hit that I heard about. But you could hit it if you were not careful. Uh, this is our bombardier. It's our navigator. Co-pilot and captain, Captain Rosenswig, a great, they were all good guys. He was a great guy. He was super. So typical crew was 10? Uh, typical crew was 10 to begin with, but after about six, seven months, when the P before the P when the P-51 came, right after we started to go in combat, Pretty quick afterwards, in my estimation, they saved the Air Force because up to that point, the Thunderbolt P-47, and if you remember that aircraft, a very powerful, wonderful aircraft, but it could only go at, in, at certain bombing targets so far, and they had to turn around and go back. And, and then the Luftwaffe, within 10 minutes, was after us. They knew when they turned back. When the P-51 came, they saved the 8th Air Force. They could go to, to the farthest target with the Polish border, like Merzburg, which was a ball-bearing uh, complex that we were desperate to uh, uh, obliterate because it was very important to the war effort. And they could go all the way with us and come back and, for, and, and even fly all the way to England with us. But they were, most of them were based in France because they started moving the bases forward as the Allies advanced. And a great crew, all good guys. And I had the best sense of humor. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I mean, they're all the good guys, but I always had a joke, and uh, I always like to uh, tell jokes to keep the m whatever something crazy came to mind. I always <coughs> pop off. I mean, I always get a laugh out of them. So anyway, did you guys stay together all the way through? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is a Hotel Hilton for the <laughs> for the Gunners. The 334th Squadron had tents. Not all of the squadrons had. They had, uh, they shared uh, Quonset huts with other uh, squadrons. Uh, we were lucky we had tents because it was good air conditioning. <laughs> we had a little pot belly stove, which uh, about, uh, was across the street there was a barbed wire fenced enclosure that had the coal and uh, what was that other fuel? Probably 
No, no, it was, uh, it, it, it looked like coal, but it was kind of, Humbling. no, because it's bumpy, and anyway, we had both kinds, and we used to sneak out, the gunners uh, would take turns every night with a bucket, and at the back, one of the smart engineers had cut the chain link fence, and we would go in and fill the bucket up. But one night, I, it was my turn, and I was filling the bucket. And all of a sudden, a light comes on in my face, and somebody says, What are you doing there, Sergeant? I said, We're cold, sir. We're, I'm getting cold because we ran out, and it's, it's cold. It was fro frosty, like everything like this, but more snow. And he says, Okay, fill up that bucket, and don't ever let me see you here again. But we kept doing it, and he, <laughs> and he, never, he never bothered us. He knew he was a, a pilot in another squadron. He knew. They got, they could, you know, nobody questioned them. They'd get what they want. That's why he yelled at me. He was, had a bucket in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I could see, I knew who he was. Every time I passed him, I, hi, why? to the best ball side, and he would laugh. I was just playing jokes, so anyway. Um, that was it. Uh, the, uh, this was all uh, pa field, pasture land, and uh, sort of hilly. Uh, one day on a day off, we, we were, all of us had dressed, and we were going to the mess hall for breakfast, and we heard what sounded like a, a motorcycle. And it just sounded louder, and we looked at each other, and one of the, I don't know who, whether it was Tony or Stan, went outside, and he said, hey, come on. A buzz bomb was going over, you know, they didn't go real fast, and behind it was a, either a typhoon with 20 million cannons or a Spitfire trying to shoot it down, and they both went into, went, See, that was east. It was coming from the east. It was, then it went south. It was going southwest. And it, it, it disappeared. The noise went down. The fighter, I don't know if he shot it down or, or what. But the, uh, the first time we had ever seen a buzz bomb, we knew we had heard about them. And also the V2s, uh, which we all witnessed once when we got off the train on a weekend for a leave in London. And this was a huge explosion. And when we looked into the uh, horizon about, it, I, we couldn't guess, three or four miles away, we saw this huge smoke cloud. And it was a V2, and it had devastated a neighborhood, knocking down homes and apartments and stuff like that. So it wasn't a good feeling. It was scary. And uh, we all started to walk towards there, and, of course, the police were out and uh, we wanted to help or do something. He said, no, no one's allowed. We have the emergency crews going and many people were killed in that, uh, that explosion, that one V2 bomb. What part of England were you in? Say? I couldn't hear. What part of England were you in at the time? Uh, when the bomb went off? Yeah, but, but this was oh, this. This was our base. Uh, the Horm Air Base in the little town of Dis. How and far would it have been from London, sir? Oh, uh, about 90 miles north, north, northeast, and uh, by train it, uh, during the wartime was uh, we would uh, about a two-hour train ride, and all going into London a lot of times, someone would s uh, shout, "Hey, look out the port side!" and we'd see uh, mangled aircraft, sometimes a Spitfire, sometimes a Messerschmitt uh, 210, the light bombers that were shot down. So uh, that was in the, like the, uh, not near any large cities, but in the open fields where it was easy to see in a train at that time uh, were all sort of old fashioned and didn't go very, if it went 25 miles an hour or something like that or, or slow, where we could see it, and all, the Air Force guys were always, you know, would look to see uh, what was shot down. And anyway, uh, you don't have to go back. Okay. Uh, we were used to sleeping in a tent, you know. 
as long as we could keep warm at night. And all our belongings were, each guy had a, like a rack that all our clothes and things hung and had a, uh, a locker for personal belongings. And uh, so there were six of us in there and it was, it was uh, you know, it looked small. It wasn't huge, but it was enough room. You know, we weren't sort of like bumping into each other. Okay. What sort of food did they feed you in that mess hall? You know, the food was pretty good. They always, you know, they, we always were ribbed when we met, you know, like on a train from uh, other bases, uh, not so much uh, Air Force, but Army, or rather, and they'd always be uh, saying, well, the Air Force always gets better food. It was pretty good. And of course, 18, 19, 20s, you know, you'd eat anything didn't eat you first. <laughs> you know, we were grow growing. We were growing and the food, uh, you know, as I remember, it was pretty good. It was, you know, I couldn't complain. <laughs> we always could get seconds and, and like I say, you know, when you're that age, I remember my appetite was incredible, although I, uh, I, never, I never could show the results of eating so much food. I would burn it off. I ran, uh, played, uh, I ran uh, uh, varsity track and B football, I made my letter in each, and so I, my, my father had a, this kind of build, you know, so I didn't have to worry about what I ate, so. <laughs> now I look back, that is funny, but it's true. <laughs> okay, ah, okay, this is a picture of the tail end of the B-17, that's the guy with the hair, and uh, that's a flight suit, and, uh, what it is, it's a w lamb wool inside the jacket and the pants. Even the boots were lined. Inside of that, I wore uh, very lightweight uh, coveralls that had uh, buttons. And under that was a heated suit like BVDs. And there was a pair of pants and a top that uh, you buttoned and everything. And then it was connected it was uh, with electric wires, and you had um, like uh, boot, socks, boots, sort of, that were soft, and that uh, plugged into the pants. And you had mittens that plugged into your sleeves, so, and then when you positioned you like me, I had to crawl back from the waist position of the B-17. Uh, there was a small seat about this wide, about that long that I sat on, and when you, uh, before we really got to altitude and near enemy territory, the captain would let you know. I crawled back and sat down, and I plugged this suit into the side of the aircraft, and you could control the heat to some degree. You had to cool it down a little bit or heat it up. And uh, I had a helmet which uh, had earphones in it, and uh, my oxygen mask. So I was pretty buttoned. We were all were buttoned up. You know, we didn't have a, a lot of uh, physical movement. Uh, we could uh, uh, walk or crawl, uh, but you couldn't get out and run a, a, the 440 in this outfit. We had boots uh, that went over those uh, stocking, heated stockings kind of things. Um, just to tell you now, in case the question comes up, how did how did the tail gunner get out of? You, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. You wear a leather flying helmet. There was also a steel pot with sort of ear flaps. Yes. Yeah. Which one, or did you wear both? There was just one. What did you say about the steel? That there was a steel helmet. No. A little like the uh, infantry. No. Helmet. It had ear no. No, it was just a, it, it matched the material of this, right. and it had the flaps, and you could hook it if you wanted to. Right. Uh, in the gunner's position to my left, and on the starboard side of the aircraft was a, a square door uh, big enough to accommodate a gunner to get out. And it didn't open regularly this way as the airplane's going this way. It opened this way into the airstream. And on the outside, 
that B-17H had a, a mid, midway in the height had a little scoop. So when you unhooked it and it moved out, the wind hit that scoop or went like this and it flew away. And you, uh, by that time you had unhooked yourself. And we had, uh, or I forgot to tell you, on top of all of this stuff, we had a, a, a parachute harness. I had a chest parachute, mm -hmm. and it was sitting right here, and you'd lift it up, and it had two, two hooks, and you would snap it on, and you would dive out, hopefully didn't hit any, you know, hit your foot or something, and it had, you know, that you had to count, I don't know, I forgot. 10, 12, something to clear the aircraft. You were really clear anyway, because most the movies that I had seen and the practices that we went through on the ground, when you went out in the airstream, gotcha, you went out head first, so you kind of, going out in a tail position uh, was pretty, pretty good, because you could get clear of the air, aircraft. Uh, anyway, that, uh, you were warm. You didn't have to worry about it. And, and like I mentioned before, the twin 50s were all, uh, back there in the tail were all handheld. They were not electronic. The two waist guns were were handheld. The belly uh, turret was electronic. The chin turret was electronic. The uh, top turret, the engineer, that was electronic. And uh, then the handheld uh, waist gunners and the radio man had one was a token. I don't remember ever hearing of a radio man shooting down. And he could, you know, he had to stand. Um, and the navigator had two sight guns, uh, which was very hard to knock anybody down in that position. I mean, you know, it just they stuck out this way. It, it, it was just very hard to shoot one down. But the the plane was loaded though with for bear. It really was armed very well, I have to say. And the only thing, a little thing, we had to worry about the speed of the Messers Messers made of four hundred and forty miles an hour going past it. So okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Mike, when you were uh, two questions, sir. When you were flying in formation, yes, approaching your targets. Mm -hmm. What, what was the uh, how relative to the other aircraft in that in that uh, stack or whatever you call it were the planes to each other and at what altitude would you typically be? Well, every every target was a different uh, altitude and uh, at the briefing, especially for the navigator and the pilot and co-pilot, were giving and in, given instructions at what altitudes to fly. We at every group had a command aircraft and a command pilot and uh, when he dropped his bombs the rest of the group dropped their bombs now uh, when we approached the uh, flying we were fairly well uh, spaced because uh, once we crossed enemy lines the captain would ask all the gunners to test fire their guns so the, the squadron would move out and it was all staggered we knew where to shoot. We didn't shoot. It never was known that we shot down one of our own bombers. <laughs> Test firing. I made a joke. Uh, and uh, uh, clo getting close to the bombing target before be before the initial point that we always we didn't go ever go straight into a target. We always had a certain way to go, and then it was the initial point where we would turn in. To the target, and at that point, it came in. Everybody adjusted, so the bomb uh, patterns were were pretty good based on what the command pilot and the lead B-17 said. And you had a second question. It was how close were the aircraft to each other relative, like a hundred yards? You know, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I I could only guess. Not too close because you didn't know about turbulence from, you know, when you get too close and you, uh, you had 18 B-17s, one, one uh, squad, uh, one group 
and a turbulence from multiplied by four, 36, 72 Curtis Wright engines churning. He didn't want too much of this because the lead guy, he isn't getting anything and he's, you know, you wanted it pretty calm so if you try to drop it, you know, pretty close together without endangering the airplane near you, but above you, ahead of you, or behind you, something like that. I don't, I can't, I would only guess, but it was a very uh, rigid time, and uh, if there, if there were, uh, before the P-51s, they, on the, uh, after the initial point, we then really got the attacks because everybody was concentrated on the bomb run and uh, they would attack. Well, once the 50 P-51s came in, the, uh, that didn't happen. You didn't have to, you know, they were, they were incredible. A great pilots, great airplane. Like I said, they saved the 8th Air Force. Thank you. Yeah, uh, there was somebody, did someone back there have a question? Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Mike, when you're being attacked and you're following a plane with your gun, let's say, and an attacking plane, isn't there a danger of all of a sudden getting a, one of your planes from your formation into that line of sight? We always were aware of planes behind us, and they weren't ever directly behind us because everybody was staggered. But if they were ahead and bombers behind, the ones behind really had the best chance of hitting them. So I don't know, it was just a gut feeling. You know, there's never been, we never, that I ever heard that we, we uh, had hit another plane. I don't know how to explain it, but it, ne it never, it, it didn't happen in our group. It might have happened, but I never heard of it. It was very possible. But of course, as you were tracking, you always, could see, if you could see another one of your own bombers, you just you had to come off off the triggers. Yes, sir? Were any of the bogies hiding your vapor trails, in your comp trails? <laughs> Funny you should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> um, on one of our raids, and I can't remember uh, what it was, was a huge amount because there were, I think there was between four and 500 B-17s in a long trail going to a major target, not behind each other. It was all, you have to understand they were all staggered. That day was in, it was in winter, uh, somewhere between February and uh, spring. And uh, you know what, the contrails, you all, all know what a contrail is, I th I'm sure. It's the hot exhaust into a uh, atmosphere of extreme cold or changes where they, the aircrafts with f four engines and that many hundreds of bombers in a long line, maybe seven, eight miles long going to a bombing, bombing target left the most incredible contrail pattern I've ever seen in my life. It was like a wall. And when I say a wall, it was not a bunch of thin strips. It, there were so many airplanes, it actually made a solid, huge, I don't know, two, three miles maybe wide, and, and uh, I don't know how deep. One of the gunners made a report to his Captain, uh, Captain, I just saw a cannon tracer come at us real quick. So he announced it to the group. They announced uh, all the tail gunners in the top turn and the ball turns. And a, all of a sudden, this airplane without a propeller came through real fast, shooting cannon fire. Everybody, 1836 airplanes that was close as our group and the next group opened up. I know I used every one of my 50 caliber bullets, shells. Everybody must have depleted it, tried it, and in seconds it was gone. But as it was curving away, the starboard side of the wing that we saw little sprinkling things all of a sudden bent and went straight up, and it was cracked here, and it went down. 
So all of a sudden, the gunner says, that plane didn't have propellers. And the captain says, shut up. Were you getting uh, orders? There may be more coming. Uh, we didn't know what it was. And when we got back at the briefing, and at the briefing, uh, they t the, the officers knew. They didn't want to scare the gunners, I guess. We were told it's a, it's a uh, German aircraft uh, that didn't use propellers, and it was an engine that blew flame and fuels. It was a, uh, they called it a jet, and it was capable of over 500 miles an hour. So that somebody hit it was, was unbelievable. But of course, 36, 30, 72 50 calibers firing, all it took was maybe one or two shells to hit that wing root that were adjoined the fuselage, weakened it, and it went like that real quick, and it went down. Who, who it happened in seconds, just seconds. Why, who, who drew first what? Who drew first what? Our group. I know. Which gunner? Oh, I, I don't know. You're the one that hit it first. <laughs> Nobody knew who it was. <laughs> okay. All right. Here, I, there's the oxygen mask. There's my helmet. This this was uh, on a. Actually, they took uh, the waist gunner took my picture. He took, had a little camera with him, and it was before we crossed uh, enemy lines. We just did. Uh, you know, had gone to Aladu, put the mask on, so he took a picture of it. So I, you know, I had collected certain pictures that you're seeing here and saved them, and which is part of this uh, description. Okay. There, that's not me. I don't think it, no, it's not me. But there's... That guy don't have hair. Say again? <laughs> that guy don't have hair. <laughs> you, you can see the old sights, which was the, that steel... See it right near his face? That, that's what he pointed before the electronic sight came up. And uh, there's the 250s. That's uh, canvas or some heavy material that allowed the movement. You can see the movements are not extreme, uh, up or down. Are those lights or something at the bottom? What are the no, I don't know what that is. That's two, it looks like two something that uh, can be removed to make, to get in front of the, uh, the mounts inside to do repair on it or something. That's all I could guess. I don't remember what that was. There's a B-17, my group, square B. That's the ball turn, they're dropping, uh, looks like 500 pounders uh, on a bomber. It's the chin turn. And th this uh, angle here, that's where a, a 50 caliber came and the navigator would sit back there. He had one on each side. And this, uh, that turned on the top was very effective because he could, you know, shoot everything above and, and it would, could spin completely 360 degrees around. Here's a B-17 that's under attack. Square B, my group, is was, thank God it wasn't my plane, but this plane landed. See the damage on the wing here? They had a, a Fokhoff uh, 190 attack. That was a German fighter with a radial engine, very effective fighter, terrific fighter, very fast. But they, they made it back and they landed okay with that damage. There's a, there's a clear picture of it. They, they, they didn't really like it too clear because we could be seen real easy, especially by any aircraft gun. It's making a bomb run. But you know, uh, I don't know what kind of bombs are. I don't think those are 250s. They look lighter. I don't know what that was. But it is my squadron, square B, and it's a good picture of it. How many 500 pounders could you carry? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. How many 500 pound bombs could you carry? <coughs> um, 
I think our load was was uh, two thousand, three thousand pounds. I'm not sure. Let's see. Two four. That's two. It might have been uh, two four six. It could have been eight. Could have been four thousand pounds. I'm not sure. I forgot. I think they took eight to ten five hundred pounds. Okay, so I'm right then. There's a, a, a typical day, the not being attacked, and uh, you're looking at two groups there. You can see how they're all staggered, and that's my group, square B, and that was a clear day. But just imagine compressing those contrails all together and making more of them from all those different airplanes in that long stretch that created this wall that that, that German fighter stayed in it to make a surprise attack. I guess, you know, the, whoever hit, they were lucky to hit that plane with its speed. It was just incredible. For, for 500 and, I think it could, 530 miles an hour, the 262 or mm -hmm. some, some incredible speed. Never saw anything fly that fast. Okay. Another, another scene, a higher group above took a picture down. You could see this before coming to the target. They were fairly uh, spaced away from each other and not under attack. Okay. Now here's, here's a group up there under attack from German fighters. One, two, Three, four. That was at the very beginning when we came, when they were still safe on the, what they called the pursuit curve. What they did when they came close, it could be something else. Could be dive, or they could do it from the bottom and come up. But this shows you uh, what's happening here. And here's a here's a group here, and they they had started to turn to get in line. This is before evidently before the target. And they were coming from different places in England. They didn't, they didn't all join up over France. They were coming from all different air bases in England. And they had a certain place where they met to get in the combat position and bombing position to go to the initial point where they all, when they came to the certain place, they all made their turn to go to the target. But there's, that was an amazing shot to get to get the uh, contrails of German fighters. Ah, there's our Sabre, P-51. <laughs> what an airplane, what pilots. I had a, all of us had a thrill one day. Uh, we were grounded that day because of uh, weather and uh, a loudspeaker came on from the control tower. All of you guys that want to see a P-51, come to the airfield, he had a, uh, something with the oil, uh, it was a break in a line or had the oil pressure start dropping and he had, couldn't go to his base and he called in and asked permission to, real quick to, to land. When I got there, it all just had touched down, but the whole base, especially the gunners, you know, it was a crowd of us along the line where he landed. And it was it was a great feeling to you know shake his hand and finally they told us get away let them <laughs> let them come to the briefing room or whatever so if, uh, what they did is uh, they didn't repair the plane on our base they came uh, he they came in a transport plane and took them home and a couple of days later uh, several large trucks came and uh, smaller vehicles and they took the wings off and they put it on this huge carrier and they took it back to their base where they could, whatever they do to it. But it was a great thrill to actually get that close to the guys that really helped protect us. It was very meaningful. You see so many guys running in one, in one direction towards the landing field, it was funny. <laughs> ah. there, <laughs> there I am. I uh, got a 45 pistol strapped to my waist there. 
Uh, I didn't drink because I had a stomach condition, but they offered uh, scotch and bourbon and beer to any of the any of the flyers that wanted, and they had uh, uh, people from uh, the entertainment industry. I forgot when you go to their dances, but they had these tables laid out with donuts and uh, every you know all kinds of snacks and soft drinks and coffee and all that stuff. But I couldn't drink. But most of the guys would, uh, you know, take a swig of it. And uh, there's that light uh, coveralls that I wore. I had taken off my uh, that wool outfit and taken off the heated suit, and that's uh, how it was ready before we went to briefing. For for about half of the time that I was there, at the early part, when we landed. Uh, Four of the gunners and it rotated of this airplane, which happened to be ours, we would uh, refuel the airplanes. Towards halfway through, then they, they started to refueling airplanes. We didn't have to do it. In the morning before takeoff, four of the gunners would, two gunners to an engine, would prime that engine. We'd turn those props two or three times and prime each one with like an old car where you had to choke it to get gasoline or we'd all stand back and clear, clear and the, and the engine would, you know, fire and this burst of smoke would come out. And, and then we, you know, could get, and when we were turning, we had almost everything on. So it was kind of cumbersome to do. We had to do it. So. But that changed too, about halfway through, then the ground, some of the ground crew, they had changed what they were doing. And uh, w the reason we started doing all that is that all they had, they had at the beginning when we were just armored gunners who immediately went to the, each gun station to check hum how much ammunition it needed to check the gun, clean them, and got them. It was ready to go. When they finished that day, they could have gone back out, but it was ready for the next morning or the next day whatever missions they had planned for us. And uh, anyway, I looked happy. <laughs> back to get back there. Yes, sir. How many ground crew did you have for each aircraft? There was usually, uh, just for the guns, we had about three guys that would check all the guns, make sure that they were clean, that it worked, and rearmed. But we also had guys that came out and checked all the controls, the engine, uh, whatever they do. And I don't remember how many, but they brought them out. Sometimes they were waiting at the hard stand. They called it cement. Each bomber had a spot and they did everything there and it was ready to go. When we went out in the morning, all we had to do was prime it. It was fueled. It was ready to go. So they had some communication with the tower on how to, you know, how to taxi out. And I remember this long line waiting its turn to take off. And B7, by the way, the B-17 is a great airplane. Pilot, what kind of guy this? So he was so great. On the way over, he would let all the gunners that wanted to to sit in the co-pilot's plane. And coming back, the same thing anybody wanted, you know, it was so easy. It was like driving a car practically. But of course, the pilot never left his position. You always make sure the guy, the gunner, knew, you know, did what he had to do. It wasn't any foolish turning yet. How nervous was the crew? Were you take the pucker meter all the way out to your target? We were, we were, we were scared. We were always scared. Well, I have to understand the gunners were all young guys, and of course, maybe. Maybe they didn't take it as seriously. The, all the officers were older, more mature, so I mean, they didn't show their fear. But of course, when the bombing run started, everybody got very concerned, and look, waiting for an attack. The flak, if it was a really a primary target, the flak, which is the anti-aircraft guns. Some of these places had 500 guns. So this Merzberg, they said they had over a thousand uh, anti-aircraft guns. Uh, it was very scary, and of course they're looking for fighters all the time. And when we got through and came back, and there was no attack with fighters, we were sight a sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. And we really was happy when we crossed the enemy lines. You know, then you could uh, 
take most of your uniform off, your, all the heavy stuff off. And, uh, it was scary. We were young, it was scary. My, my crew was, we were very uh, lucky. Our plane was hit a few times, very minor bits of flak might have hit it, put a little hold on it, not in a, in a, near an engine or, uh, you know, a certain place that would hurt that airplane. Yeah. Going back was a great feeling. <laughs> <coughs> this is, uh, this is a B-17 that had been restored this, uh, in my hometown of Ventura, California. And it happens all over the United States for a group of uh, flyers, mostly officers and uh, donors had uh, supplied funds to uh, do what they had to to make it flyable. And they would go to certain air, uh, airports during the year all over the United States at different times and offer uh, people to get in and look at it and offer flights too. If you wanted to fly in one of those uh, for about a half hour, they, they would charge you and you get, got to fly B-17. It's funny, when they always went to land where I lived, I was in the, in the, uh, the flight path of the runway so you could always, I could always, and my neighbor across the street was a veteran Navy guy, and we both would run out or come from back or we were doing guard and whatever the heck, because we knew the sound of this, these four Pratt & Whitney engines and would see it come over, always went over my house. It was just a great feeling. Yeah. Why don't we finish up? Okay. Uh, that's a, the same, the same uh, field, and... Uh, of P-51 restored, which was my favorite airplane. I got a chance to talk to the pilot and get over and look at it closely. It's a restored P-51. Great fighter airplane. Okay. Uh, I was um, privileged. I was picked amongst other World War II veterans. You might have heard of this. Rocky Mountain Honor Flight, where B-70 and the so uh, B, uh, I'm, I'll be okay. I'm having a memory moment. <laughs> uh, World War II uh, people were invited once they passed the physical to go to Washington D.C. to stay three days to see all the memorials in a hotel. Everything was paid for, and we uh, 35 men at a time, or and women, you know, wait ladies that had been in the, and we got to see all the memorials, uh, the, uh, the one for uh, United States was great. Uh, I had never been there in Washington, D.C. in my life, so I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, five of us got together during uh, the walk. And we uh, got ice cream bars at this uh, snack bar, and we were talking. And one guy says, you know, did you ever tell your, your kids, your family, about your service? I said, no, I never, I never thought to do it. I just didn't want to talk. It wasn't necessary. And every one of them, in turn, said, I've never told my family about it. Well, from that point on, and when these guys invited me here, they opened up a Pandora's box because you can't shut me up now. <laughs> <laughs> there we are uh, with, with this group of veterans. 35 men and women came with us. There are many people in wheelchairs. So they had to have people to help them get them off the buses, on the buses, on the airplanes, off the airplanes. And they were made up of volunteers, younger people, uh, some of two or three nurses uh, to help. It's funny, there was a young woman, I don't know her, her picture's in here. She wrote this about me. That's her. She, she prepared a book on, on the computer about me. It stunned me. And... <laughs> She took pictures of the groups there, and she was a volunteer. 
And she, she, before we separated, when we came back, she says, you mind if I make a book for you? And I said, what is it? Sure. So one day she called me and came over to my house. She brought this wonderful book. And, and she wrote this thing which knocked me out. I didn't ever think of myself as an American hero. And that's her, a lovely person. She was a helper. One of the, two of the helpers, we uh, were dressed just in plain clothes, but they were uh, one, a, la a girl, a young woman. She was a uh, first lieutenant at uh, Lowry, and the guy was a major uh, at Lowry, and they helped. We couldn't, we thought all along they were helpers. I mean, you know, I Hey, you know, pass the ketchup or something like that. But they were wonderful. At every airport that we took off or landed, people saw this huge group of veterans, which they finally realized, and they they would uh, walking through the airports, either going or coming, they would crowd around us and shake our hands, and thank us for our service. It was a great feeling. Some of they were crying, we were crying. It was a wonderful feeling. Where did the money come from? Donations. They have a group. This, this group is a nationwide. They have a group that, as a matter of fact, one of our veterans, his, he invited his son to come along. His son worked for a big corporation. The son was a vice president, and he called the president, and he got approval for a big donation to, to this group on our flight. And he announced it, and it was, had to be approved by the board. It's a very large corporation, I forget the name, which is really nice him to do without being asked. So anyway, that's my story, and I want to thank everybody. I have some friends and faces here that I know from where I live, and the rest of you look great, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to me uh, speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.